lashes the coastline, destroying beaches, boardwalks, and homes. Dunes were flattened, but the towns they protected suffered less damage. Now, as communities rebuild, NPR presents Two Ways to Make a Dune. The first recipe is a classic, friends. All you'll need is sand, water, wind, and a dash of beach grass. Start with a regular beach and add a little wind. The faster gusts will pick up grains of sand and start to pile them up. Now throw in the beach grass. It will slow the wind so it drops its sand. Dunes will begin to form and the grass will keep growing, creating a mesh that helps prevent erosion. Salty waves will kill the grass closest to the water, so you'll have a stretch of empty beach and, where the grass survives, a line of dunes. That empty beach is important, though. It supplies sand and maintains the dew. The wider the beach, the bigger they will become, and the better they can protect the land beyond them. Every now and then, as sea levels rise, a major storm will flatten the dunes and push the entire beach inland. But don't worry, the dune will grow back in a dozen years or so. But hold on. What if there are buildings where these new dunes want to grow? What if you want the dunes back where they can protect those buildings? Well, friends, try the second recipe, the one used by many folks today. You'll need a few extra ingredients, some heavy equipment, a few additives, and a large serving of cash. First, push all that sand back down the beach. Of course, left alone, those piles would quickly erode, so you'll want to build them around a foundation. Discarded Christmas trees work well. Then add some old snow fences to keep pedestrians away and trap the sand, and plant some grass on top. Of course, with a shortened beach, there won't be enough sand to maintain your dunes, so you'll want to dredge sand from the ocean floor and rebuild your beach. Of course, any shoreline that sticks out into the ocean will be washed away, so you'll want to build up the beach in both directions. Now you have a working dune. Each time a major storm passes through, simply repeat. It will cost a lot of money. It will take a lot of labor. And as sea levels rise and the beach erodes, these dunes will become more and more fragile. But at least you won't have to move. Mother Nature's recipe is much easier. Just sit back and relax for a decade or two. And of course, you'll need to move that house. This video was produced by Adam Cole. Vicky Valentine and Ben De La Cruz were the senior producers. For an animal to survive in a marine environment, it's always a challenge. But what part of the marine world presents the most challenging conditions? 
One of the areas that surely has to top anybody's list is the intertidal. The intertidal is the area between the lowest low tide and the highest high tide. The conditions here are some of the harshest of all marine environments. The organisms that live in the intertidal are subjected to wild fluctuations in salinity, temperature, and of course they're constantly punished by relentless wave energy. The challenges that the plants and animals here face are unlike those of any other part of the marine world. When the tide goes out, we're able to access the inner tidal from the shore. This area that's underwater during a high tide becomes exposed and what's left behind are tide pools. Here in Hawaii, the tide change is only about three feet on a really big day. That means that the tide pools here are just a few feet and sometimes only a few inches deep. Nevertheless, they remain fascinating places to explore. As soon as the tide goes low enough that a tide pool is cut off from the ocean, the sun begins to heat the water and it starts to evaporate. As it evaporates, the salinity or saltiness of the water increases. This is really stressful to most organisms, and the plants and animals that live here have to have adaptations that allow them to tolerate extremely salty and hot conditions. The first thing you notice in these tide pools is that it's not a coral reef. Corals can't handle these types of conditions very well, and the substrate, or the bottom of the tide pool, is generally either bare rock or is covered with algae. Amazingly, there are fish that can live in these tide pools. Obviously, they have to be small-bodied fishes, and many of them are juveniles of species that, when they grow larger, will leave the tide pool areas and live on the coral reef. Other species, like this Blenny, will spend its entire adult life inside the tide pool. Towards the end of the low tide, a lot of the water in the tide pools has evaporated, and a lot of the available habitat for the fishes has dried up. This causes many migrations within the tide pools into the last remaining available habitat, and space is really at a premium at this point. The fish all get concentrated in, in the last remaining tide pools, and this is where they have to stay until the incoming tide replenishes the water supply. Fortunately for us, the incoming tide means it's time to leave the area before we get pummeled by the waves too.